In this lecture, we're going to be looking at ethnicity and crime. We're going to first off look at the trends in um, ethnicity and crime, looking at the official statistics data and what that can tell us. And then we're going to look at the causes and reasons behind these trends. And there are seven causes that we're going to look at. This is not an exclusive list. Um, there are more theories that you can use from some of the other areas of sociology that we've been looking at. But these are um, the seven that there are seven that we're going to look at as part of this lecture. So if we first, so if we first of all look at some of the trends. So this is the data from 2018, 2019. Um, we have to be a bit cautious with data from uh, 2020 and 2021, just due to COVID mitigations and um, changes that have occurred due to that. But in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2019, if we look at the population in general, you've got 87% of the UK population was um, considered themselves white, which left 12.8% as ethnic minorities, which covers uh, Afro-Caribbean, Asian, uh, Middle Eastern, all the, lots of different ethnicities um, within that group. So our first graph here um, looks at um, so this graph here is looking at prison population. So we're looking at how the, the rates of prison um, or what's the word? Nine, uh, incarceration. There, there was another word that I was looking for, but I can't remember it. But um, the rates of incarceration for different ethnic groups throughout from 20, 2004 to 2018. Now, if we look at the white list, it's pretty settled. It's, it's pretty much um, stayed the same. We see with black groups, there was a peak in 2008 and then it's kind of dropped off and become pretty steady. But what we have seen is both Asian and mixed ethnicity groups have had this massive increase, a sharp increase in incarceration since 2004. However, if we now look at graph two, where we're looking at the length of custodial sentences, that's what I was looking for, custodial, um, custodial sentences, we can see that when we look at um, the rates of uh, the lengths of prison sentences, ethnic minorities, black, Asian and mixed all have longer sentences than whites. Okay, the, in 2018, the average sentence for a white person would be around 18 months, whereas for blacks, uh, sorry, mixed groups, we're looking at more around 24 months. Um, and 22 to 24 months and then for Asian and black groups we're looking at between 25 and 30 months so there's a big difference there of almost 10 months which is a pretty much a year in the length of sentencing for black and um, Asian people if we then look as well now at stop and search um, data if we look here this is for all stops and search so seven out of a thousand people in the british population will get stopped and searched per year okay and bearing in mind there are a few billion people on the planet so although that's quite low quite it seems quite low um it's per thousand population and to give you an, an idea the wyndham college population is around 2000 so we'd be over the course of the year we would expect it out of everybody who works and, and studies at Wyndham College 14 people would be stopped and searched in a year now when we look at Asians it jumps up to 11 if we look at blacks it uh, black ethnic groups is 38 um, mixed groups are back down to 11 white groups are only four per thousand population so again we're seeing huge discrepancies in the numbers of stops and searches of ethnic minorities compared to the white majority so what conclusions can we come to 
Now, when it comes to comparing to white people, which is the ethnic majority of the UK, black people, in particular Afro-Caribbeans, were three and a half times more likely to be arrested, five times more likely to be in prison. They're more likely to be found guilty and receive a custodial sentence, meaning that they're going to go to prison three times more likely to be cautioned by the police compared to a white person and if they're arrested they are more likely to go to court and be charged than receive a caution and then if we look at the comparison with asian people asians are twice as likely to be stopped and searched and in this with asians it tends to be for drug offenses or presumed drug offenses they're more likely to face um, court and be charged rather than receive a caution. They're more likely to receive a custodial sentence if found guilty, and they're more likely to be arrested for fraud and forgery. So what we see here is that if you are from an ethnic minority group, you are likely to have more interaction with the criminal justice system you're highly likely more highly likely get the words in the right order more highly likely to um, go to court and to receive a custodial sentence which means that the prison population is disproportionate in the number of ethnic minorities in prison compared to the population so what sociologists are interested in is why why is it that ethnic minorities are represented more highly in the criminal justice system than the white ethnic majority. Now bear in mind as well that the, we are looking at percentages here, not raw numbers. Because if we look at raw numbers, then yes, there are more white people in prison than there are black people or ethnic minority people. But when you look at that in comparison with the percentage of the population, there's a higher percentage of ethnic minority um, citizens in prison than there are proportionally to the white majority. So we're going to look at seven possible reasons for the criminal for these for these trends and why ethnic minorities tend to be seen more within the um, criminal justice system than the ethnic majority. And the first one we're going to look at is the demographics argument which is put forward by Morris and what Morris says is that ethnic minority groups contain a disproportionate number of young people compared to the ethnic white ethnic majority so what he's saying is it's not about ethnicity it's about age and because ethnic minorities tend to have a younger age demographic there are more ethnic minority um, young people between the ages of 19 and 25, uh, 26, then the, which is the age group that is more likely to be involved in criminal activity. So it's not necessarily regarding ethnicity, it's about that demographic or age bracket. And he explains that because um, the young are more likely to be involved in criminal activity through various reasons. Um, this can explain the, the cause of higher proportionality of ethnic minorities in the um, criminal justice system. But there is a statistical illusion here. It's impossible to determine if it's the age of the offender or the ethnicity of the offender that causes the higher rates of criminality. So it's a chicken and egg situation. Is it the age that's causing the criminality or is it the ethnicity? Um, or, and I mean, none of these theories, none of these causes or explanations are in isolation from each other. They do all interlink as the amalgus knottiness of sociology always is. But Morris, fails to really make that clarification and really kind of give the clarity that it is the age that's the issue and not the ethnicity. The second thing we're going to look at is police targeting. 
So Phillips and Browning in 2007 said that ethnic minorities are over policed and under protected. So in largely ethnic minority areas, you will see a higher uh, police presence, but they're not, according to Phillips and Brown, they're not there to protect the people in that area. They're there targeting them. So um, Gilroy talks about, in 1982, released a study called The Myth of Black Criminality where he said that there is stereotyping within the police force. He stated that the police focus on ethnic minorities and therefore because of that focus, they are more likely to be stopped and searched. And because they're being more likely to be stopped and searched, they're more likely to find something that they're going to be arrested for compared to white people. Um, so what the police targeting is saying is that ethnic minorities are a focal point for police officers. And this is particularly prominent post 9-11, post um, July 7th bombings in 2005, where um, there was an increased threat assessment for terrorism, which disproportionately focused on ethnic minorities. So this targeting of the ethnic minorities for stop and search for um, checking where they're going, what they're doing, leads to greater arrests. Um, because if you go out looking for something, you're going to find it. And that's to say, and this kind of theory suggests that if the police targeted what the white majority, we'd probably see an increase in white people being arrested and white people being in the criminal justice system. Because if you go looking for something, you will find it. Okay. But the problem with this is that these it, the targeting is probably caused through moral panics. And as I already mentioned about 9-11 and the July 7th bombings, but after those two events, there was a significant moral panic related to um, Muslims and Middle Eastern uh, ethnic minorities because people were scared and we saw this again in the 1970s with the Black Muggers and the Philip Hall study. Um, so it's possibly not based on any additional criminality within those groups, but an actual fact is forced or not forced. That's probably the wrong word is created due to this moral panic. And again, it comes we come down to a chicken and egg thing where is targeting leading to eth higher ethnic criminality, ethnic minority criminality, which leads to more targeting, or is the targeting creating the moral panic, which is causing a great in a, a deviancy amplification spiral, and it's then again, it's not really giving us an answer to the question. It's just kind of suggesting that there is a very complex system of targeting of stereotyping of labeling that has led to um, the higher levels of criminality within the criminal justice system for ethnic minorities. The third theory we're going to look at is political protest, which comes from Gilroy. And Gilroy argues that ethnic minorities and in particular black men often feel alienated by everyday experiences of racism, and um, social exclusion and what they perceive as a racist police force. And as such, they then turn to criminal behavior as a form of protest. Street crimes are seen as resistance against white oppression. For example, the crimes of the Black Panthers in the, during the civil rights movement. They engaged in criminal activity and deviancy in order to highlight white oppression of ethnic minorities. But the problem with Gilroy's political protest theory is that a majority of crime committed by ethnic minorities is against other ethnic minority groups. So there are more victims of black on black crime than there are black on white crime. 
And if crime was a form of political protest and um, a way of highlighting white oppression of ethnic minorities, we would expect to see more black on or ethnic minority on white crime, which and because we don't, that kind of undermines Gilroy's theory that there is a political protest element to criminality. Additionally, not all of these crimes can be linked to protest. For example, domestic violence or um, crimes of passion. There's no political gain from these. Whereas vandalism or theft, robbery, street crime could have more of an impact in terms of that political protest and criminality theory. Our first one we look at is the triple quandary theory that comes from Tony Sewell. And Tony Sewell suggests that there are three risk factors which could be responsible for the relatively high levels of crime amongst black males. So he's putting forward, he's saying that these risk factors in combination, not in isolation, in combination, increase the levels of risk of black boys and black youth becoming criminal. The first one he talks about is a lack of father figure. So um, Sewell suggests that a large number of single mother families amongst black families mean that boys look to their community for role models and these can sometimes be gang leaders and criminals within their community. Now the first thing we can point out with this is that his, his suggestion that black families are more likely to be single mother families is actually onerous and not statistically provable um, and it's, he's coming from a very new right per, um, position here suggesting that women are unable or incapable of adequately socializing boys which leads to higher criminality but there is actually no statistical evidence to suggest that this is the case there's also um, a lot more black male role models available around these days. Um, so even not ha not necessarily having a male father figure at home in the media, you've got people like Barack Obama, um, Mo Farah, um, Marcus Rashford, who are all providing very positive role models for um, black boys um, as well as um, other ethnic minorities as well. The second part of Sewell's um, triple quandary is negative experiences of white culture. He argues that black boys are disaffected by their experiences of school policing and employer racism and they are marginalized through when they show their own culture and we've seen this in some instances and so we'll use the example of um, hair in schools and how some ethnic minority hairstyles are not allowed within schools or um, we can use as well the study by noon who looked at uh, who did a study where he sent out a hundred identical um, job uh, prospective job letters to various employers and the only difference in the letters was the name either he used Jones or he used Patel um, and other uh, ethnic names um, or he changed the gender and what he found was that ethnic minority males were less likely to receive a reply even less uh, more so women ethnic minority females were even less likely to receive a reply and that this kind of suggests 
that there is an unconscious bias or even a, an absolute outright bias against ethnic minorities when it comes to employment. And this disenfranchisement of culture, of employment, can lead to marginalisation, which can then lead into criminality. If you don't want me part of your culture, part of your society, why should I then follow your rules? However, the problem we have with this, or, or there are changes that have been occurring. Um, a lot of companies now use blind applications where they take out any um, information regarding ethnicity, gender, age, when um, deciding who to take for interviews. Obviously, they can't change, do blind interviews. That would be weird. Um, schools are changing their dress codes. Um, and not penalising for ethnic, um, cultural kind of dress or um, hairstyle, etc. So things are changing. The final part of Sewell's triple quandary is the uh, is the media, and media influences, and in particular, Sewell talks about hip hop and rap, and suggests that these um, stars show young black boys that status can be achieved through the acquisition of status symbols such as designer clothing, jewellery, cars, housing, material um, goods and through the construction of hyper masculinity based on violence and sexual conquest. So he argues that this exposure and in particular he talks about um, drill music and um, rap music and these 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 kind of statuses that these stars portray and the lifestyles that these um, people portray according to Sewell lead young black boys into criminality because they want that lifestyle they believe that that was what will make them a man what will make them um or gives them status, I should say. Now, the problem with this, again, is that the, 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 not all of these rap stars and drill, drill music and all of these things, it's assuming that all of these black boys are into the same thing, that there's this cultural hegemony amongst black boys, which there may not be. And also they count any for every negative role model there might be, there are two or three positive role models out there as well. So it's triple, the Sewell's triple quandary theory doesn't really stand up to the reality of modern culture. And he also doesn't quite explain how um, this leads to black on black criminality or ethnic minority on ethnic minority criminality. So it's a very causal, casual relationship between these three factors and criminality. Next up, we have subcultures, and this is going back to the work of Lee and Young. We can also bring in here um, some work by bon um, Hershey and his bond theory as well. So Lee and Young suggest that ethnic minorities are more likely to suffer relative deprivation and marginalisation within their communities. And as we you'll remember from the left realist theory of crime, this marginalisation and relative deprivation combine together to lead to criminal subcultures. So it leads to them creating their own sense of norms and values to alleviate feeling, these feelings of marginalisation, to overcome the relative deprivation that they feel like they are suffering from. And they, these subcultures can lead to higher levels of criminality, as we saw with the um, left realist theory of crime. And we can bring in Hershey's bond theory here, because if you remember as well, and this kind of links back to demographics as well, if you've got higher levels of um, young people within the ethnic minority groups, 
they are likely to have less of a connection between themselves and their community, less of those social bonds that Hershey was talking about, which lead to higher criminality. Um, however, we can again criticise this subcultural theory of criminality by looking at Matz's, Matz's view that membership to subcultures tends to be quite short lived and people tend to grow out of these subcultures by the time that they hit their late mid to late 20s. And yet we still see higher levels of criminality in that age group with um, ethnic minorities. Um, and also we, we have to bear in mind that not all subcultures will be criminal. Um, it's a mass generalization to say that a subculture will automatically be a criminal subculture. And with bond theory, um, this idea that there is a limited, limited social connection in ethnic minorities, again, suggest it's bringing out that chicken and egg of is it the age or is it the ethnicity that's the problem that, that's causing the criminality. Our sixth theory is locality theory and cultural transmission. So locality theory was first posited by the Chicago School in the 1920s and Waddington et al. in 2004 applied it to ethnic minority criminality. So we're going to go back and, and kind of back to the original theory, the locality theory, before we apply it to um, ethnic minorities. So the Chicago School in the 1920s just looked at Chicago, strangely enough, um, and they kind of looked at where the levels of um, crime were in Chicago at the time. And they zoned out Chicago. So the central zone, the loop, as they refer, refer to it, is kind of the centre of the city. So in London, for example, this would be what we would consider the city of London, the banking, the um, old um, oh, legacy type companies, um, your, your kind of Harrods and your Fortnum Mason and, and things like that. Zone two is your factory zone. This is where you're going to get your kind of warehousing and, and things like that. Zone three is your zone of transition. This is cheap housing. Okay. Get, uh, they refer to them as ghettos and slums. And I don't think perhaps in London or in modern society, uh, Western society, we perhaps refer to them in the same way. But this zone of transition is high rise housing, cheap housing. It's close to the employment opportunities in the factory zones and um, in the working class homes and, and things like that. So it, it's where people gravitate to when they first arrive in a city or in, the, in some cases in, in a country. The working class home zone is what they also refer to as the second immigration settlement. So after you've been in the zone of transition for a while, um, you've established yourself, you've got yourself a job, you've got some money coming in, you perhaps move into zone four and the working class homes. You've got a little bit more money now to be able to um, afford better housing um, and better um, living conditions. And you've got the opportunity, the, the financial means for transportation towards uh, to, to your employment. Zone five is what we would refer to as maybe middle class suburbs. Um, Chicago School referred to these as single family dwellings. And um, these single family dwellings, we're looking at more middle class homes. Um, the, this is where you may have, rather than perhaps share, house sharing, you're more likely to find those single family dwellings. And again, people are more affluent in these areas and again, can have the transportation to, to, to work. 
In zone six, we refer to this as the commuter zone. So this would be kind of the green belt around uh, the outer, outer London, those that would perhaps train into work, um, high uh, upper middle class families um, with uh, so perhaps we're looking here more at, again, single family dwellings, but larger housing, more green spaces, um, more schools, things like that. So what locality theory suggests is that it is this um, zone of transition here that has the higher levels of criminality. Okay, so the zone of transition, oops, is that a word? Higher, has a higher crime rate. So when Rod Waddington et al. did their study in 2004, applying this theory to ethnic minority criminality, what they found is that the zone of transition not only had a higher crime rate, but it also had higher ethnic minority um, populations. So they argued that when ethnic minorities or first generation immigrants come to the UK or come to um, any country, they're likely to end up in the zone of transition where the housing is cheap, where it's close to work and things like that. So therefore, the higher levels of criminality that we see in ethnic minorities is because the police target the zone of transition due to its higher crime rate. Now, again, we get into that um, chicken and egg situation. Does it have a higher crime rate because the police are targeting it or are the police targeting it because of the higher crime rate? But this locality theory also talks about how not only are the zone of transition a higher densely populated ethnic minorities, um, but there is also a lack of social cohesion. So this is where we get into this cultural transmission. So what um, is suggested is that the zone of transition is an area of social disorganization. There isn't the informal social control from peers, families, neighbors, communities, which leads to delinquent subcultures. There's rather than looking to formal agents of social control to maintain um, non-criminality, this informal social control isn't there to do that role that it ha does do in zones four, five, and six. Marshall et al argue that this zone of transition has what are referred to as sink estates, which sat, lack any sense of social control. And what he refers to as sink estates are these high rise council housing estates that have very high levels of criminality. They have um, high levels of um, vandalism, um, low income families, low educational prospects, um, and these sink estates, as he refers to them, don't have, again, that informal social control um, to prevent this criminality from occurring. And that leads to differential association. And essentially what that means is, if everyone else is doing it, why shouldn't I? The idea of, well, they're all getting away with it and they're all, everyone else is doing it. Um, as parents often use with their children, if everyone else jumped off the cliff, would you do it too? In this zone of transition and these sink estates with the delinquent subcultures, the answer would be yes, according to the cultural transmission theory. So this argument is that ethnic minority criminality is due to the locality of where they live and a lack of social control, which leads to the transmission of delinquent subcultures and differential association. Now, the problem with this theory is that it only really applies to first generation immigrants. Um, many ethnic minorities have moved out of the zone of transition by the second generation. 
and are in the in zone four or zone five and yet we're still seeing higher levels of ethnic minority criminality what we're also forgetting here is that within the zone of transition there is that social informal social control there are enclaves of different ethnic groups so when somebody moves to the zone of transition they tend to gravitate towards areas of their own ethnic group for example in london you've got chinatown um, areas such as um, edmonton have high turkish um, families of, of um, ethnicity and so there are enclaves of these ethnic groups where there is social control informal social control and there are people there who are reminding people about what is and is not acceptable so this idea of being in a highly an area of social disorganization doesn't quite work it's just that the these areas have a slightly different set of norms and values to the majority of the country our final theory then is institutional racism and this is a big one that has been um, a huge part of the media and the news in the last few years so we, pro we, we know the word the word has been out there for a very long time and we did discuss this a little bit when we talked about um, education but when we're talking about ethnic uh, institutional racism there are three levels to institutional racism the first is structural and this is up top if you like this is the policies and procedures that within an organization within a social institution that would be considered racist so within the police force this could be the targeting of ethnic minorities but the the policies that are employed and the strategies of how people are told to do their jobs within the police force is structurally racist we then have cultural racism within the police force and this again is not necessarily talking about um, people that join the police are racist but this links into what's referred to as canteen culture and this was put forward by Holdaway um make sure i get the spelling right e or a? A. in 1983 and was backed up by a documentary called the secret policeman um where it was talking about how an individual may not be racist but they get drawn into racist systems and beliefs by trying to fit in and if you remember we talked a little bit about this when we did education about those peer group pressures police officers have to work with one another so they may get drawn into racist banter which is not banter it's just racism um, drawn into a way of talking a way of acting um, that is racist even but when they're outside of that situation they would never even consider being behaving in that way and that's not to excuse it it's it's completely unacceptable but it holdaway suggests that this canteen culture that has developed within the police force is a culture that perpetuates racism within the police force and then leads to higher ethnic minority um, cr uh, criminality so it's not necessary it's not the ethnic minorities that are more criminal it's the way that the police are interacting with ethnic minorities that creates the trends in the statistics the final level of institutional racism is individuals and unfortunately we cannot get away from the fact that there are racist individuals within the police force and 
we're unable to necessarily get rid of this structural racism because these individuals end up in positions that create the policies and procedures within the police force. And they may not be overtly racist, but their behavior, their language, and the way they interact with ethnic minorities can lead to, it, it is racist. And again, we see evidence of this, oh, where's my pen gone? Um, in that documentary, The Secret Policeman, it's on YouTube, it's also on the website. Um, it's very, very hard watching and very uncomfortable watching, but it's evidence of this institutional racism within the police force. Now, you know about the Stephen Lawrence murder. We, we've done Stephen Lawrence Day in school. Uh, we've talked about Stephen Lawrence before. After his murder, there was a, an investigation um, into institutional racism in the police force. And in 1999, um, McPherson report was published and it highlighted how racist the structure the culture and individuals within the police force were and put in suggestions of how this could be how this could be um not attacks that's not the right word um dealt with there's another word i was thinking of and i can't remember it um but and there was a very long list of things that the police force needed to do both at a structural level, a cultural level, and an individual level to, to kind of eradicate or minimize racism within the police force. Since the publication of the McPherson report, there have been active changes to the police. There has been a recruitment drive for ethnic minorities within the police force. Those police officers who, um, show demonstrate racism are dismissed and uh, there was an example not that long ago of a police officer who was dismissed for um posting racist comments on social media and for sending racist messages via whatsapp um and th th this has been a long process now the mcpherson report came out nearly 25 years ago and there is still a lot of work to be done as we saw with the black lives matters um protests after george george floyd in america um and even though we have seen some changes there hasn't been a decrease in ethnic minority criminality so either these policies are not being enacted fully which is or there is are the reasons for ethnic minority criminality. So, in summary, the trends show that ethnic minorities are more likely to be stopped and searched, more likely to be arrested, and more likely to be given custodial and longer sentences um, within the criminal justice system. And there are a number of reasons for this. Um, we, we've got the demographic trends, police targeting, political protests, triple quandary theory, subcultures, locality theory, and institutional racism. Now, as I said before, none of these explanations are in isolation. We can see how the demographics could link with subcultures. Police targeting links with both locality theory and institutional racism. Um, the triple quandary theory could link to um, subcultures as well and locality theory. So none of these theories in and of themselves is the reason. They all play a part. Okay. The type of essay you could get might be um, identifying one of them as a theory and you have to say whether or not it's true or it's, you may get a relative importance question on this. Regardless of what it is, you need to be able to outline and evaluate each of these explanations and you need to be able to summarise the trends in the statistics.